my name is John Lyman. I'm director of the Energy and Environment Program at the Atlantic Council. Welcome. We're very glad to have you all here. And given the size of the audience, you should have ample opportunity to get participative questions. <laughs> we can come down to the front so you can keep on trash us. The uh, renewed emphasis on energy efficiency with governments has really been a, a game changer that's going on because we're now getting at a time of higher energy prices. It's becoming apparent that this needs to be government policy. And I think you heard this morning, uh, this noontime on this and, and the ministerial meeting also, this discussion went on a lot and it just almost every, every country in the region is, is starting to pay a lot of attention to this subject. The energy efficiency per unit of GDP uh, declined by 1.5% in 2012. And this was on a sort of global basis. And that doesn't sound like much until you realize that the average decline, or, the or put it another way, the average increase in energy efficiency between 2000 and 2010 was only 0.4%. So this is starting to have an impact on worldwide demand for, for energy. And it will have a bigger impact as governments develop better programs, better incentives, and we get more public interest in the subject. Obviously, the biggest improvements have been in countries with highest energy intensities, like Russia and China. China back in 1990 actually consumed on an energy per unit of GDP four times the world average. That's now they consume at half the world average. So that's an eightfold change in, in how they've been doing things. Other countries will start to do that as well. There's lots of programs now that are really trying to push this subject. There's the EU, EU Energy Efficiency Directive, which you may hear about. In the US, we've got a lot of appliance standards. There's similar things in other countries as well. There's motor vehicles in the US with this determination that you heard at lunch uh, by Secretary Moniz of doubling our efficiency of vehicles by 2023. There's big building efficiency moves in Europe and Japan, and we're doing similar stuff in the US. Air conditioning in the Middle East. Uh, United Technologies is doing stuff there. When I was in India, there was a big push on en increased energy efficiency for air conditioning there. Um, in the, the US is going into bilateral activities. We have done U.S.-China Climate Change Working Group is working on ways to moving this subject forward. And believe it or not, there's actually energy pricing reforms in places like China and India, which is, you know, you think is unusual. The bulk of improvements have been in electricity use, electric motor systems, appliance standards, lighting, transportation. One of the things that is holding down improvements in energy efficiency for much of the world, though, are subsidies in energy consumption, which is a major barrier to investment. I mean, if it's so cheap, why bother? Forty countries have been identified as subsidizing fossil energy. Middle East, Asia, Venezuela, other places. In the Middle East, the payback on a hybrid vehicle is 18 years now, given all the subsidies, versus four years in Europe. And that, that, that thing, we're going to shrink faster in Europe, and the US is going to start catching up with Europe. In 2012, those subsidies cost governments $544 billion. And over half of that was on oil products. So we're not only subsidizing it, we're creating wasteful use, and we're not encouraging energy efficiency. I think we're very lucky to have today three speakers 
who have got a tremendous amount of interest in the efforts going on around the world in these areas. And you've all got your books with their bios, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time backing up their, their historical information. But I, I will want to say that they are all intelligently, incredibly talented and very knowledgeable. So I think even after they give their talks, which they'll each do for about five, six minutes, maybe a little longer, uh, we'll ask, ask a few questions, but I want to open it up to the audience for you to ask them questions uh, so you can get some of your concerns addressed directly rather than hear some of my concerns, which I, I could always get at. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Jason Bordroff, professor and director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. And he's going to use the U.S. situation of demand as a case study, but I think they're going to learn a lot that is relevant to much of the world. Jason? Thanks to the Atlantic Council for... Uh, for, for, for having me and putting on this uh, extraordinary summit. Uh, I have been a professor at Columbia only since January, so I'm very new there, uh, having just left the White House uh, uh, in January, having spent the first term in the Obama administration. So I've had a total of five students in the time in my history at Columbia, and I'm pleased one of them is here today. So one-fifth of all students I have ever had are in this room today. Uh, so it's a special treat to, uh, to be here. Uh, and to talk about energy efficiency. Um, I, I hope the, we have a small crowd, which is good for discussion. I hope it doesn't reflect the interest of folks at the summit on the supply side versus the demand side. But I think the demand side is particularly important and where we're seeing a lot of really exciting uh, trends and developments. Energy efficiency, we all know, is one of the most important means to uh, save costs, to increase economic growth, to improve industrial competitiveness, uh, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental uh, pollutants. And the potential is just enormous. Much has already been done. We've seen declines for years in energy intensity in the U.S., around the world. Uh, last year, global energy intensity declined 1.5% which was quite uh, an aggressive rate that compares to about half a percentage point uh, for the first decade of this century. Uh, and the potential is really enormous to keep that going. Efficiency represents the largest source of untapped greenhouse gas emission reductions. There's no stabilization scenario uh, that I know of that is realistic uh, that doesn't include a significant piece of the pie for energy efficiency. Uh, uh, Fatih Barol, who I thought was on the panel, but is not. It was a typo in the book, but he was at Columbia over the summer and presented the climate change report that the IEA put out over the summer recommending four steps, all of which are zero or negative cost, that policymakers could take to, in the near term, keep the possibility of a two-degree stabilization target in the realm of reality, and by far the largest piece of those four was uh, energy efficiency steps that could be taken. And I was pleased to see that the IEA just released an energy efficiency market report consistent with the other fuel reports they do on coal and natural gas and oil, uh, recognizing that it is kind of uh, hidden fuel, maybe even in some cases not so hidden, and trying to put some numbers around the size of that uh, market, which is really quite large, $300 billion invested in energy efficiency uh, last year alone. Um, we often talk about energy efficiency as the low-hanging fruit, free money lying on the floor, and I think uh, their economists tend to be skeptical that there's a lot of free $20 bills on the floor, but I think when it comes to energy efficiency, there really are. They're hard to pick up, that's why they're on the floor. If they were easy to pick up, people would have already uh, done it. But for a variety of reasons, like um, asymmetric information where the maker of an appliance and the consumer don't have the same information because of imperfect information where people don't uh, fully understand uh, consumption and how to calculate costs for principal agent problems like landlords and tenants in, in, in buildings, uh, or because of uninternalized social costs like greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants. There are a range of market failures which do suggest that there is a role for policy to help step in and pick up some of that free money on the floor, help promote economic growth uh, as well as encourage improvements in greenhouse gas emissions. And there are different ways you can do that. Um, 
Price is certainly one, the way that the market does it on its own, uh, and consumers do, for different kinds of fuels in different places, respond uh, to price uh, signals. Uh, and then policy also steps in. Uh, and it's necessary, because there are all those market failures, I think, to talk seriously about policy standards for appliances, like you heard we're doing in the US, price signals through tax policy, uh, investments in R&D, because we know the private sector tends to underinvest in R&D relative to the social benefits of innovation, uh, and information and behavioral nudges like setting defaults or you know, duplex printing or, or, or power saving modes and things uh, that actually do, when you add them all up, make, uh, make a difference. In the US, we're doing really all of these things. Uh, Energy intensity in the U.S. has consistently fallen since the 1970s, uh, and we've made rapid progress in recent years, even more rapid, more rapid than any other IEA country. And so what I wanted to do is just spend a minute talking about uh, oil demand in the U.S. as a case study for how we've put some of those policies in place, because I don't think it gets enough attention given the boom that's happening in light tide oil in the US. So that, that's, that's a big story, it's really important, it gets a lot of headlines and attention as it should, and the numbers really are quite staggering. So if you look at uh, the annual energy outlook, the US government's projection from 2005 and compare it to the most recent one, which came out just about a year ago, the amount of oil the US is projected to need to import in the year 2025 is today 12, billion, uh, 12 million barrels a day lower than the US government thought it would be just eight years ago in the year 2025. That's a staggering number. We consume 18 and a half million barrels a day. Uh, and uh, part of that is certainly because of production. Production's up about two and a half million barrels a day over the last three years. You heard Secretary Moniz at lunch uh, say that just last month, US production uh, exceeded US imports for the first time in nearly 20 years. We're close to being the largest producer of liquid fuels in the world. But it's not only because of production, uh, it is also even more so because of consumption. And so when you look at those projections for crude oil imports in the year 2025, uh, and again compare them to just eight years ago, three quarters of the reduction that is now projected, the difference that's now projected, comes because of reduced uh, demand. Uh, and, and so that, that's a, an incre a really significant thing. And it's not partly because cars are getting more fuel efficient. Interestingly, it's also because for the first time in history, vehicle miles traveled is going down. U.S. drivers are actually driving fewer miles uh, than they did the year before for a variety of reasons like prices and some demographic uh, shifts and other things. Um, the reason fuel economy is, in, the reason that oil demand is projected to go down so much comes from a few different things, both, uh, both market driven and also policy driven. So in the market, it's partly a response to high prices. Uh, when you take, when you average over a period of time to take out temporary spikes like oil prices in 2008, looking over the last 18 months, oil prices are adjusted for inflation, the highest they have ever been, and consumers do respond to that, particularly when it's not a <coughs> spike that goes away quickly, but when it's a sustained higher level of oil prices. Um, so we have seen that, and not just high oil prices, but also low natural gas prices. And so for the first time, you really can see in a serious way the potential for natural gas to displace oil uh, in probably not passenger vehicles anytime soon, but in trucks, in trains, in uh, marine transportation, and also in industrial uh, applications. Not just in the US, but globally, we will see these are still small numbers, but the growth rate is significant, and we'll see uh, meaningful displacement of oil for, with natural gas, I think. But it's also policy-driven. So you heard the secretary say at lunch, we doubled fuel economy standards. We also imposed for the first time ever uh, fuel economy standards for heavy-duty trucks. Uh, and those will have a really significant impact through uh, 2025 and then, and then beyond. Five years ago, Chrysler did not make any vehicles that got more than 30 miles per gallon. Today, they make five. Uh, last year, Ford offered eight models, which set a record, uh, that are expected to deliver 40 miles per gallon or higher. So they are responding uh, both to consumer demand because of price and also to the policy mandates and the fuel economy standards. The government's also investing in R&D uh, in the U.S. to try to allow this to all uh, accelerate and happen uh, in, in, in batteries, in electric vehicles, in 
advanced biofuels, lightweighting materials, improved uh, efficiency of engines and tires, and then also through behavioral nudges that I mentioned before. Uh, we change the label that is on a car when you buy it to make the information about the cost of operating and owning that vehicle more transparent to the user. So it now only, not only includes miles per gallon, it includes gallons per mile, which is actually more informative than miles per gallon and is sort of counterintuitive, uh, but you know, if you take two drivers that drive in the same distance, and one switches from a car that gets 10 miles a gallon to one that gets 12, and the other one switches from a car that gets 30 to one that gets 50, the first driver has actually saved more fuel. It's a little, we can walk, walk through the math later. It's, it was counterintuitive to me at first, too, but it's because the returns from increasing fuel economy standards are not linear, and they're diminishing uh, as you move further down the curve. And then also showing consumers how much uh, how much the average operating cost of that vehicle is each year and how much they would save relative to the average vehicle by purchasing a more fuel efficient car. So all of those things make a difference over time. And this is for gasoline prices, where the price signal could not be conveyed more clearly to consumer. It's on price cards that are three or four feet high on every street corner. Imagine what it's like in your home where people have no idea uh, how much the main energy, you know, consuming appliances, how much energy they use. They have no idea how much it costs to buy the electricity that they're using for these things. Uh, so it's even, it's even more imperative, I think, that in those settings, policy steps in along with uh, uh, prices driven by the market to help give people the information they need and to set defaults and standards that can help us reduce uh, energy consumption over time and really pick up that large piece of free money, low-hanging fruit, and make a real dent in both saving consumers' money uh, growing economies and reducing emissions over time. So with that, I'll stop and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Jason. I'm going to now turn to Francisco Sarasi, President and CEO of Enol Green Power. Here's a, here's a gentleman who's actually in the business of doing something about renewable energy. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, John. Actually, uh, I am a little bit uh, ill at ease here because I am not a professor. I was not your student, I'm not one of those five, and I'm not working in a think tank, I'm not really studying things, I'm actually in the midst of uh, trying to run the, a renewable energy company. Right. So one wonders why should I be here, because this has nothing to do with renewable energy. But there is always a little bit of an overlap between energy efficiency and renewable energy, and I don't know why, but it is like that. It happens. And, and uh, I think there is some kind of rationale around this. In fact, if we take uh, a look, first of all, at what renewable, uh, what uh, energy efficiency means for, uh, for a society uh, or a big country, and when I say big, I don't mean necessarily physically big, but electrically big, because there are a little bit of, you know these maps? that depict the world uh, and according to consumption of beer, for example, the Netherlands are a very large country and, uh, and for example, China is very small. And if you take electrical consumption, many countries in Europe have very large dimensions. Europe is in fact uh, quite a large electric power laboratory of what is going to happen next around the world. And it is not out of arrogance that we're saying this, but just because we made mistakes earlier than others, so we're learning a little faster what happened. And we have seen, for example, about five years ago, the 2020 uh, agenda um, being launched at the European level. All member states have a target of efficiency they need to, to reach by 2020. Italy, for example, 20%. But that means we should curb the consumption when compared 2010-2020 by 20%, which is a lot. And of course, the energy, uh, the uh, economic crisis is helping a lot in this case. So we might be able to reach a lot of these targets with a, with a lot less efforts thanks to the fact that the economy went into recession and people started to really save, okay? And, and if I can give you some figures, and this is the first time, 2009 was the first time since after the World War II that families saved on 
electrical consumption going one year after the other uh, in Italy, uh, you know, typically during recession periods, which happened before, we always saw families' consumption going up. This was the first time in which families started saving energy. They changed pattern, they changed behavior. <clears throat> and this is not going back. I mean, once people have learned how to save energy, it, it, it starts to become part of their daily life. The, fa the fact is that this, uh, this energy efficiency efforts uh, have basically, so far, largely failed to become a big business. So they have become quite a successful story because there is an achieved result, but not a lot of money is made out of it from the part of industry that, see, that saw a business in this. And, and we look at this and, and, and try to understand why this is. And we found out that there are basically three reasons and there are basically three big players in energy efficiency. One is the industry. <clears throat> in the, if you look at industry, you try to convince a factory that if they invest a little bit here and there, and if they change something about their production rationale, they will save enough money that maybe in three, four years, this will pay back. And three, four years is a short time. It's pretty good as an investment. But many factories don't know if they will be around in three years. They simply don't have enough visibility about their future to invest in this. So this is now quite a small fraction of the, of the business. There's simply not enough certainty about their own existence to really buy into it. They say, it's great, but for the time being, my order book goes only to mid-2014. What next? I mean, I don't know. Why should I get in this next time? Then we take <clears throat> the other big chunk of the business, which is public, um, the whole large universe of public consumption. So schools, hospitals, uh, the army, you know, the police force. <clears throat> and these people, they really consume a lot and typically they throw away a lot of energy. Um, but they have no freedom to contract. They basically go through tenders and they have to go through public tenders. And I tell you, to, to set up a public tender for energy efficiency is one of the most complex te technical and administrative tasks that a public administration can do. In fact, only very efficient public administrations do that, and they are the ones that already consume less. So <laughs> the, the big chunk of the waste is not accessible. So the, the third leg that really works and has been quite successful is us, so the private individuals. We think we will live a long life, all of us. And we think we will be in our home forever, all of us. And we think our home will even live longer than we do. So we don't care to invest in our homes. And that's, in fact, the, the only segment of energy efficiency that is working, and it is the most complex. Technologically speaking, it's a huge array of different appliances, and it covers energy, it covers gas, it covers every aspect of our life, and it's a very, very complex business to put your arms around. Actually, even a large utility as we are, we don't know where to start with this. And actually, this is a business for very small niche players or suppliers of more efficient uh, appliances that make a business changing your appliance over and over and over. So it's a very elusive business target. Why then is renewables part of this? Because this segment of users, these people, us, in Europe, are starting to think they need to be also producing their own energy. And there is a large chunk of business in retail uh, renewables, uh, renewable energy um, applications. Um, in Italy today, we have about 500,000 uh, small rooftop applications, and the growth is around 10, 20 megawatts a month, divided into thousands and thousands of rooftops. We are working with basically no incentivization. It's already a grid parity. This stuff is now catching up, and it's happening in Germany in the same way. In, in the UK, it started, and then it was cooled off by the government because they were a little bit scared. So the thing is, <clears throat> renewables are getting into the door 
and they are combining with energy efficiency in this strange mix of a customer becoming also a producer. And mixing these things will, pro will prove to be very, very complex to manage going forward. You need, you need digitized grids, you need a lot of interface uh, protocols, and you need also storage, micro storage, and all this stuff that you read on books. And you know, there is a lot of discussions, where is it with the smart grid, you know, wh when is the smart grid going to happen? And sooner or later, someone will find out that the smart grid is already there. Just it started from the bottom up. We have parts of Italy today that for days and days have grids working backwards, you know, feeding energy from low voltage up into high voltage and going from the homes of the people back into the grid because consumption is exceeding, production is exceeding consumption. So we have parts of Italy already working in a smart grid mode unofficially. I mean, can we say this is a smart grid? I think a few years from now, we will all say, yes, we have a smart grid, and we don't know when it started. So, okay, so you're, you see, you think you're, you're making progress, but it's really, uh, it's a slow, slow trip. On energy efficiency, I'm sorry to say, there is a lot of progress, but I cannot say that it is a big business on a single standpoint. I mean, it's a, it's a business for many, many small fragmented chunks of industry. There is a lot of innovation, there is a lot of technology, and it's a very, very elusive world. Okay. You know, for a big company, I think it's a disappointment overall. So for a big I mean, company... I mean, no, no offense, I mean, it's, I think it's great as a consumer, you know, staying in a big utility overall, you will, you will find lots of utilities saying it's fantastic. Don't believe it. It's not. It's just not happening. And I, well, that's a great lead-in to Guy, because uh, Guy is going to talk to us about, is this something that has to be done by policy and the public sector intervention, or is this something that should occur sort of naturally, which is the same sort of follow-on to your topic, uh, Guy? Give us your perspectives. The guy watches this area very carefully. I mean, it's a question, is it really market failure, or should one just trust human ingenuity to do this? Thank you. Thanks, John. Can I just um, pick up, Francesco, on your last sure. comment yeah, yeah. about the business not being that big? No, no, not for us. I mean, Right. I think that's the point, that if you're yeah. trying to isolate the, the sale of an energy efficiency service, there are challenges, but the, ch the, the, the reality is that the, the benefits to the economy of energy efficiency are huge, yes. and they happen every day, so... Absolutely. I'm not denying this. Right. I'm just saying, so the benefits from of the point of view of a large utility, I don't want to make names here, I'm saying those big utilities that have, are sending the bills to everyone, are they making a big business out of this? Not. Right. We're not. Okay. I'm telling you, we're not making I'm, a I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> Other people, yes. Right. And it's, it's, that, it's that incremental, imperceptibly small change in, in the materials used in the tire that they put on your car yeah. that improves the rolling resistance Absolutely. by half a percent or something infinitesimally small that permeates throughout the economy. You can, you can identify big step change technologies like compact fluorescent light bulbs moving to LED light bulbs, um, uh, you know, an, an, uh, LED screens, TV screens. Yeah, it wasn't 10 years ago we were watching TVs with cathode ray tubes and valves that would overheat. And now the, even the, the, the laptop is being replaced by the iPad, and that has got a tenth of the power of a laptop. So. The, the efficiency improvements that we are seeing throughout the economy are really profound. Yes. Um, and I think, John, you mentioned some sort of national statistics. If you split the world into the developed world and the developing world, the developed world is improving its energy intensity about one, one and a half percent a year. The developing world, China, India, is improving at two, three percent a year. The problem for the world is that GDP is increasing at three percent a year, real. So, on average, we are consuming more energy in the world, even though we're getting better at using it. 
And I think there's that trend in, in, in energy efficiency splits into two supporting sort of um, drivers. One, which we've talked about, is the technology itself. Uh, cars, electrical devices in the home, lighting. Um, aircraft are now 25% more efficient than they were 25 years ago uh, to transport a person one passenger kilometer. But the other shift that we're seeing, and this, this, is, this is a sort of a rule of law, uh, um, is that as economies evolve, they become less dependent on the energy intensive parts of the economy. They move from primary manufacturing to the primary industries to secondary manufacturing and then to services. The most valuable companies on the New York stock market today are Apple, Google. Then now I think Apple is now more valuable than Exxon. So that is a, that, that is sort of a, a uh, you know an illustration of how much we value knowledge and if it, and the efficiency with which we go about our daily lives, our ability to, to to use our time more productively, rather than the infrastructure that we have around us, the buildings, the cars, the, you know, the materials that we use. There's only a certain amount of materials, energy embodied materials, that we can actually consume as individuals. We can, I can buy a bigger house, I can have bigger rooms, but on, at the end of the day, I, I can only really have one, maybe two houses. I, I, no, but there's a limit to how, many, how much materials we can consume as individuals. We then start to move into more, um, so the returns the economic returns to energy start to diminish as we get wealthier and wealthier. And that's good news if we want to try and see a point in time where we have peak energy consumption in the world, which we will, somewhere we think, somewhere between 2025 and 2030, including China and India. We are going to see energy consumption peak, even with growing population, because the wealth will reach a point where the improvements in energy efficiency will start to take over the trend in, in underlying economic um, growth. Um, is there a case for government intervention? So this is an incredibly powerful, these trends of the evolution of the economy towards the service sector and high tech and underlying technical improvements, most of those happen without government intervention. So I, you know, the point, case in point of U US vehicle standards is a good one. Do we need, I mean, I haven't got the statistics, I would say 90% of the energy efficiency improvements that we see and reuse daily do not come about because of government policy. They come about because it just makes sense. And every time you buy a TV screen, it's going to be more efficient than the previous one. We had the, mobile, the mobile economy we have with our apps on our phones happens because it happens to be a more convenient way of using it rather than sitting down behind a PC which consumes 20, 20 times the energy. So these, these are happening anyway, these are technological improvements. Where does the government, what role does government have? Um, is there a failure in the market for our consumption of energy? Um, and um, Jason alluded to it uh, very well. I think there are a couple of examples where it is necessary. Um, uh, the first is in the building sector, which in a country like the UK, buildings consume 40% of all energy we use in the country. It's a bit less for the US because you've got higher component of transport in other countries. And there, uh, this landlord-tenant problem is really quite problematic. Uh, the people who would benefit from lower bills actually don't own the infrastructure in the buildings, the, the boilers and the lighting systems and the control systems, so there's no incentive in the building owner to invest in those systems to reduce, to reduce the bills. And this is, this is around, happening around the world. Um, in industry, it's an interesting one. When you look at the studies on industrial energy efficiency, the payback times that they have, and I've worked a lot in this sector, you will never rarely find an investment that just reduces energy consumption passing a three-year payback criteria. They're all going to be two, two and a half years. Rarely you get three. That equates, at a three-year payback, that equates to an internal rate of return of 33%. So they are putting a 33% IRR hurdle rate on their investments. Now, it's partly for the, for the point that was made about well, they don't know whether they're going to be in business in 10 years' time, so having a 10-year payback is really taking a long-term view. But in the building sector, these buildings are going to be around in 10 years' time. Um, and so incentives and policies and regulations that governments can introduce that force the, the, the expenditure on those energy efficiency um, uh, options is probably a good thing. And the, the final one is in the domestic sector, where, and I'm... I have a personal story about this where I'm trying to renovate a home. 
It's a 1930s house. It's got suspended wooden floors. It leaks like a sieve. It was built to ventilate. These houses were, in the, when they had coal fires, they were built to ventilate. I'm trying to turn this into a modern house. I cannot go to a supplier who will help me do it. I have to go to a plumber who will tell me about whether the piping is right. I'll have to go to an electrician. I'll have to go to a, an underfloor heating specialist. I'll have to go to a window supplier. I'll have to go to a, a, a contractor to tell me how much it's going to... I cannot go to a single place or even a two or three places to help me do this. So I end up, when I renovate my house, making a decision on whether I like the color of the paint, not whether it's energy efficient. And so there's a huge deficit of information and advice around how to go about this. And I don't think I'm an anorak. I just think I want to, I'm going to spend a reasonable amount of money on this project. I'd just like to make sure it's the most efficient outcome I can get. And I cannot do that. And I've tried. So there is, in terms of what the utility can do, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of niche players springing up, trying to bridge this gap. Um, the energy service company model, where in the industrial and commercial world, you do not get a separate supply for gas and a separate supply for electricity. Somebody owns both the electricity and gas supply and the building management system at the same time, and you rent it off them. That's where you integrate this landlord-tenant issue. In the domestic sector, there are companies now trying to do this at a domestic scale. It's fragmented. I think the solution ultimately lies in technology, being able to remotely manage a lot of these things, um, and using existing marketing channels. So when you've got home delivery and you've got um, businesses which are, you're allowing into your home, you can use those as the channels to build an energy efficiency service around them. So it's, a, it's an interesting play on the, on, the, on the utility model, but the domestic sector, 40% of households in the U, if houses in the UK were built before the Second World War. That's the kind of infrastructure we have to deal with. And the renovation, it's all very well having new building standards. The new building standards are 25% more efficient than they were a year ago. That's fantastic. New houses are really, really efficient. The trouble is it's going to take one or two centuries to work through the rest of the building stock. The good news for the world is that the Chinas that are, and the Indias that are building fast, they can put in new standards and they can make a bigger difference in their housing stock. But you're absolutely right. Europe has got a big problem as to how fast it can transition. Uh, there are a number of countries in Europe that have put in big incentives and some financing schemes uh, to, to help support energy efficiency. Have any of you experienced any of those and seen whether you believe they're efficient or not or, or work? I'm I'm aware of the, um, uh, well, there's an obligation now driven by European directives and has been implemented in the UK for many years, which forces utilities to invest in energy efficiency in domestic sector, particularly the low income sector, right. The, right. the less well off. And that's a fair chunk of our bills, actually, in, in, in the UK. We spend a lot on insulating the homes for other people. And that's a regulation, that's a, that's a legal requirement. Yeah, I mean, you go, you go to Romania now or Ukraine and you see lots of new windows in apartment buildings, which, you know, 10 years ago you wouldn't have seen. Well, it is, it is making a difference. Yeah, okay. Do any of you have questions for each other? I have questions for Francesco. Okay. <laughs> so I had two questions. One was, um, you, uh, you said it's not in the utility, it's not a good business for most utilities to do efficiency. And so I just wanted, I wanted you to say more about that. When the choice is building a new gas plant or building a new coal plant or building a new capacity and how the economics look of increased capacity versus efficiency and how the fact that what they charge and their rates of return are regulated in many places plays into that calculation. And then second, the question about uncertainty and investment in the face of uncertainty. Um, that is true. At the same time, we have people trying to make investments in pipelines in the U.S., not knowing where the new, how, how large a boom the tidal oil boom will be, uh, investments in the upstream. I mean, all throughout the energy sector as well as other sectors, people invest in the face of uncertainty all the time. So what's different about this that prevents capital from flowing into that market? First of all, I think um, I have to, to clarify the fact that so far for utilities, this has been an elusive part of the business. That means... There has been a lack of focus and a lack of 
clarity about what exactly is this energy efficiency all about. Uh, it went from something <coughs> negative, that, you know, obviously, I mean, it's intuitively, and to something that cannot be avoided, to something that can be a business. So some utilities start now to focus and say, because I am in touch with millions and millions of customers, because I supply energy to them, and many times also gas, I mean, not only power, and because sometimes I also give them additional services as insurance or perhaps installation of PV panels, then why can't I also provide what he is asking for, and, and he couldn't find so far, a turnkey energy efficient generic uh, advice on why not an implementation of whatever needs to be done. So I think it will take some time, and you know, typically utilities come at the very end of the cycle, they're kind of slow, but they're big and they have a lot of stamina, so I think at the end, this will happen. So far, it didn't. We're just starting now. So I think it's a question of time. That said, I think today utilities in Europe have all a common disease, which is overcapacity. Thermal generation is largely underutilized. Demand is not picking up, not only for the energy efficiency measures, but also because the economic cycle is down and demography is not helping. I mean, we're not multiplying fast enough in Europe if, if we are multiplying. So, I mean, simply, the growth is not coming. Mm -hmm. So, at this point in time, there is a little bit of a, a, an empty spot. You know, what is the next generation? There's no next generation for some time. Basically, we have to face the fact that there is a continued growth in renewables because they make their way not, notwithstanding the obstacles or, renew, or, 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 or uh, reduced um, incentivation simply because they are convenient and they start to really make a dent. But a big decision about a coal plant in Europe, I think, is, uh, is simply not, not going to be taken for some time. And um, until you see this supply and demand balance going back into business, I think it's going to stay there for and wait. On top of that, I must say that when you have, as we are having, 30, 40 percent fixed cost base uh, renewable or non-renewable uh, uh, energy into the system, a, margin, a system marginal cost uh, merchant exposure becomes a very different and very dangerous point of view going forward. So the debate in Europe is what, what needs to be changed in markets so that an informed decision can be made going more than two years, three years down the road. If you look at what happens in the UK, that you know, to justify some nuclear capacity, the UK government needs to guarantee quite a large tariff for quite a long time for someone to have the nerve to invest in nuclear capacity in the UK, I mean, that is a little bit of an issue. So a lot better to invest in energy efficiency. It's a, it's a shorter cycle. It's, it's a lot of micro decisions fragmented over time. Easier to do on renewables. You have tariffs. or you have a smaller risk in smaller plants. Mm. So going forward, I think big plants are going to be extremely difficult to justify for many years to come, unless a market design is, is happening. And, and then we go back saying, all of a sudden we go back and say, also in Europe, you can have long-term power purchase agreements, as everywhere else in the world. Also in Europe, you can do long-term PPAs, as we do in the US. And therefore, you can justify some kind of investments. Today, Europe is in a situation where basically it's very difficult to justify anything because you don't have visibility of what your price is going to be. Actually, you have a visibility, it's going to go down no matter what. So I think that's, and, I, and to go back to your question, why is it that in the US someone is doing it? Well, first of all, in the US you have an economy that kept growing. All of a sudden, you're back in the, so there is need for investment and, and visibility about the, the future uh, of, of, pro of uh, production facilities. I think because of the lower cost of energy, you have production coming back in the US and not going out of the US. 
you have people moving production facilities from Europe to the US. So you know that there is a factor in the US that will have a future, and therefore it makes sense to invest in energy efficiency. It's all about the, the outlook. And if you have a, an unclear outlook, and, and you know that there is a huge debate going on, and you know that in Europe there is a debate, what happens after 2020, what about 2030, big debate, and what about the market design, <coughs> big debate. So while this big debate is happening, I think it makes sense that the investors take a break and say, let's wait for these guys to decide what they want to do, and then we may invest. In the meantime, it is a no-brainer that utilities focus on customers and say, let's try to crack this nut of energy efficiency, which so far has been elusive. But I hope there's many people like him, you know, because that, that means it is a viable business. But there's another, there's another area where utilities are playing an increasingly important role, and that's in, um, and, in, and it's getting more and more important, and that's in managing peak power. So the flexibility markets that are being required now, so the debate, just to extend your, your last point, in terms of the way that the, the, the power system in, in Europe is evolving, and this will rep replicate in other parts of the world as they build more renewables, they're going to have to manage peak power rather than baseload power, which means they get to a point, and we've, we're facing this now, why are we spending $150 per megawatt hour buying a nuclear power station from EDF Energy in the UK, which is what we're doing? Um, because we need that reliable power. I didn't, I didn't strike that deal, and I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's the best deal in the world. But but the point is that we're going to have to make the decision at the margin, do we build another coal or gas-fired power station just to run 5% of the time, or a few hours a year, when we absolutely need it to keep the lights on? Because that's the, that's the reality. When you've got a lot of baseload renewables, you have to have the reliable access, access to reliable power for a very short number of hours. And the, you do the maths, and you go to the consumers, and you say, what would you rather have? Would you rather pay $500 per megawatt hour just to run that plant at that, that, that peak time, or would you prefer to have your, your demand reduced? And if you do that right, and you, 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 across the economy, if you go to the industrial companies, the, the commercial companies, the, the, frig, the, the cold storage companies, even in the domestic home, there's an awful lot of load management that you can build into the system. And there's quite a few examples now of, of utilities, I don't know if, if, if Anel's doing this, but getting involved in managing load in that way. You know, we, we have, I mean, just a, we have a fully digitized digital meter system in Italy. You know, all the Italians have a digital meter. So we all have tariffs that vary depending on the hours. And, and this is clearly the first enabler for a big consumer behavior change. Because if you charge hours that are more expensive and hours that are less expensive, you would imagine that people would say, OK, then I shift my consumption in those hours and stuff like that. So, but you know, this happens at the beginning, the, the first few months, and then people go back to their habits, because the difference is not that big. So <laughs> I know this is disappointing, but, <laughs> but human brain is a little bit difficult to, to, to really work around. It's not fully economic. And when we go at home, we want to be, we don't want to bother too much. You know, this is the point. So at the end of the day, the big thing is, Utilities, they have a huge opportunity to manage the grids a lot smarter in a much better way, in a completely different way as they were designed at the beginning. And that can be done. The good news is, yes, it can be done with very little expense, a lot of brain power, and it's happening. So that's really where, where the focus and the value creation for utilities is going to be down the road. Big plants, they are already there. You don't need to worry about it. They, they just don't write them off totally. They will be around for a long time because it's too expensive to shut them down and dispose of them. So rest assured, no one is going to take those plants away. They're going to be there, and, and they're going to be up and down, shut and closed every time we need. You know, when combine cycles, gas turbine combine cycles, started to appear, in, in Europe, we're talking about the 90s, people were saying this technology is not working, it's unreliable, 
well, let's keep the coal plants on. They will never be able to modulate the way thermal plants do. It's obviously not the case. So these plants can do many things. They are there. We have fully amortized them. Why worry? I want to take an opportunity. We're, we're running low on time, but I'm going to take a few more minutes because I, are there people in the, in the audience that would like to ask a question? Yes? Hi, I'm Mihala Karsten with the Atlantic Council, uh, the Atlantic Council's Energy and Environment Program. And my question, um, I think, is directed to all three of you, whoever can answer it. We see energy efficiency measures and we see increased use of renewables, uh, which are challenging the traditional utility model, and that sort of has been debate, the debate so far. What are the critical changes that you see, either in the market design or the institutional structures, that would enable this transformation that's actually needed to take hold and that can also bring a financial stream to, to utilities or to utilities in their new form if they have to change. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I think the obvious answer, and this is, this is the answer that you'll get from most of the utilities, is, well, let's have a capacity mechanism so that they can guarantee payment for, for keeping these plants online or building new ones. And that's, that's fine providing it is done efficiently. We're just about to design this in the UK, and I saw the early draft, and I was shocked. As an electricity consumer, how much money we were going to pay for these things to keep online. Um, and secondly, in a, in, a, in a fragmented market like Europe, um, I would first like to see better use of an integrated market, rather than individual markets operating in isolation and managing their capacity independently, because that's a very expensive way of doing it. Let's have better interconnection to start with. Okay. I would just say, I mean, um, you know, when we would do panels like this 18, 24 months ago, they were all about the smart grid, and now they're all about distributed generation and who's going to pay for the wires. Right, right. That seems to be the topic of the day, <laughs> uh, because there is real potential for distributed generation, and that's going to put real strain on who's going to pay for the fact that we are, very few people are going to ever fully get off the grid, and they're going to continue to use the wires, and we're going to have to figure out a utility model moving forward that that pays for them to drive this forward. And then, of course, in terms of encouraging the deployment of more efficiency and more renewables, in some cases, they're free, free money on the floor. But for the most part, we're internalizing uh, social costs. There is an economic cost to doing this. So climate policy and carbon prices and other things are obviously the first and foremost thing that we need to do. And globally, we are not anywhere near where we need to be to, to do that. You know, at the end of the day, uh, I think that if you take the 2020 targets that, it, that Europe had decided to, to reach, we are not yet there in terms of penetration of renewables, but it was, uh, it was something announced many years ago. So it, it cannot be a surprise that where we stand today. It's just where we want it to be. It's actually not even there yet. So the fact that some utilities are a little bit concerned about what's going on in the future, maybe they should have studied it a little earlier and not just now, okay? And it's not something out of the blue. It's something planned. And for a change, it's happening, you know, right, more or less in the right time frame, not even earlier than that. So what's the big surprise? I think the big surprise is what he said, what is late is an integration of the markets. Markets are fragmented. And that program is late, because it was supposed to be finished two years ago. Let's not forget, the agenda was integration of energy markets end of 2012, I think, something like that. And we are already two years late. It is a big deal, because market integration is a big fix for some of this problem. On the long term, you need to change the market design, yes. You need to have long-term signals visible. And you need to have capacity payments on a competitive, structured ways, not on a pick-and-choose uh, entity. But at the end of the day, true of, is that some of these plants need to be written off somehow. And then, once they're done writing off these plants, they are there and they will be used, as they need to be used. So we have a luxury in Europe. Can we afford that? I think we can, you know, if we just take it in, in the right time. But overall, 
if you look through the, to the rules and the agreements we had, this was all announced. It's, it's just happening, but we knew it was going to happen. It is something, by the way, what is happening in Europe is going to happen elsewhere in the world. So we are learning how to cope with it. We are finding technologies that are able to manage a complex system which didn't exist before. We will have the know-how to apply this elsewhere in the world. We will be able to have a renewable energy plants modulating and stabilizing the grid while today they are not. And the reason is that no one has asked them to do it, but they could, they can do it. It's just a question of what hardware and software you have to put in those plants, they can manage the grid. You know, you know, a solar farm is a solid state digital device. Why can't it reply, well, why can't it manage loads on the grid? It, it would all, actually it would do it faster and cheaper than a thermal plant. The question is just what do you need to put in there in terms of hardware to enable that to happen? Once we have done that, it will take a year or two we will have technologies developed in Europe that we can use elsewhere. If the danger of uh, missing the buses, I will ask if anyone else has any more questions that they would ask of the panelists. Okay, if that's, I'd like to thank the panelists for the discussion. Give them a big hand.